So I'm going to talk about uh, be, uh, Queen Ring 101, um, just because it's it's good to know what we're talking about when we talk about why we got a grant. And then I'm going to talk about the inspiration for the grant and kind of how we operated. And we'll um, answer some questions at the end. So this is our St. Louis Beekeepers mission statement, focusing on beekeeping practices. Our goal is to facilitate a broad spectrum of education, promoting healthy natural systems where people, honeybees, and other pollinators can adapt and thrive. So we've been working on this project for about seven years. And every year, some research paper gets published that just you know spurs me on. Unfortunately, this is the kind of stuff that spurs our, our determination to do this work. Um, this was a headline USDA not even a year ago, it was last February, where um, they were publishing research that indicate that 94% of, of the bees in this country come from the same genetic line in Europe, that's Italy and up in um, Slovenia and the Caucasus. So uh, that's really depressing because if anything happens that is relative to that genetic makeup, um, we're going to be in big trouble. But the, again, this is the kind of stuff, information that's coming out that, that really tells me that we're, we're on the right track. The other, uh, the other research that is kind of new, they're looking at the effects of shipping this livestock. So they will put queen bees in a box or an envelope and mail them to you. And Right now, the research that I'm hearing is anywhere out of that 70 to 80, 80 degree Fahrenheit range, you are damaging the eggs and sperm in the queen. So these are mated queens. That's the you know reproductive material, and it's getting damaged. So we're paying more higher prices because demand is greater than supply. We're paying higher prices and getting inferior qu uh, quality product. Another reason why we, we are raising local queens. So queen ring basics. Uh, honeybee colonies raise queens for three reasons. First one is to propagate. Propagation at the colony level is a swarm. They will replace an aging or failing queen that's called supersedure. Or they will raise an emergency queen when the queen is damaged, and that's usually beekeeper error. Oh, where's the pointer? Okay, never mind. Oh, I need to get rid of that. No Dragon. pointer? Dragon. Which one is it? Oh, that's the advance. No, I mean the point. Oh. Okay. 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 These are queen cells, right? The ones that are hanging vertically. Um, yeah. So the queen is the large female that has is like she gets pregnant and she gets really big. Her abdomen gets really big, so the cells are larger to accommodate the size. Um, This is bee development chart, and I promise you every beekeeper like has this either in a file or as a poster on the wall because we just have to remind ourselves of the development. But basically, I want you to look at the queen. She, um, all of the casts are eggs for three days. They're larvae for give or take about the same six days. And then the real difference is in their, is in their pupation. So they're developing... When, when the cell is capped and they're pupating, the queen emerges much quicker than the other casts. And this is kind of what they look like, you know, egg, egg to, uh, you know, when they emerge, they look like a bee. I mean, they're kind of fuzzy, but that's an egg, you know, through, through the grub, grub stage, capped, and then um, metamorphosizing under a capped cell. That's that's beekeeping terminology. Okay. Queen cell development. So from the day an egg is laid to uh, 
the emergence we saw was about 16 days. The colony can successfully raise a queen from a larva that is, oh, is almost three days old. So that's day six. Um, therefore, the shortest time that a colony could raise a queen, if you were to pull a frame out, drop the queen on the ground, put the hive back together, and they realize they have no queen, they could make a queen in 10 days where the queen is emerging. So we use this information to um, direct our management. So in the springtime, when when they're raising new queens, we have to be in the hives um, in shorter periods before, you know, less than 10 days is when we do our inspections. So queen maturation from emergence to egg, up to five, she takes five days to harden off, can take a day or up to three days to go out and mate, a couple more days for her eggs and sperm, for the sperm to come down in, in the spermatheca. So there's a number of days when she's just, you know, maturing in the hive before she starts laying eggs. Where I'm going with this is, I'm sorry, so queen mace with, a, with up to 20, uh, 12 drones, that flight can be as short as 18 minutes, which is amazing. When she comes back and starts laying, she can lay between 1,500 and 2,000 eggs per day, and that brood will start to be capped in 10 days. And it looks like it's cut off a little bit, but um, there's twice as much larva open grubs as eggs and four times as much capped brood. And where you see my pinky is a queen. <laughs> um, kind of challenging to see, but that's why we look at the larva. We look for eggs, we look for immature larva, the grubs, and we look for um, capped brood to tell us if there is a queen. You don't have to find the queen. You want to see evidence of the queen. So from start to finish, it takes 59 to 71 days, around two months for a colony who has either swarmed or decided to replace a queen or is, or is raising a queen because you damaged her, it will take a, m around two months for that colony to, to completely turn over and have the genetics of the queen that they raised. So this is our one of our arguments for why you should purchase mated queens and not let your colonies raise their own queens because of the time. This is this is loss of production. So my club, a small group of members in my club, we decided to uh, raise to start this project after we saw Randy Oliver, the gentleman in the lower right hand corner. He spoke at a Missouri State Beekeepers meeting and said, you clubs, you know, you can do this. You just get stock from your from your members, um, the highest quality stock, raise queens, and then have those queens available for your club and your community so that beekeepers in the area don't have to go out of state, you know, to Georgia and Florida and California and have those queens mailed or shipped because because of the damage, potential for damage and not being locally adapted. Dr. Uh, Geraldo Camilla is with SLU, and at the time that I saw the presentation at the Missouri State Beekeepers meeting, Dr. Camilla was publishing his research, his survey research uh, regarding bee diversity um, native bee and honeybee density and diversity in St. Louis. And apparently North St. Louis is second only to the Indiana Dunes area, which is a natural preserve. It's not a residential area. Um, but North St. Louis is pretty run down. There are a lot of industrial and residential buildings that are not being cared for. And that is great habitat for bees, both honeybees and native bees, bees because they are not um, being disturbed. They're not being, that area is not tr being treated with chemicals. They're untouched. And so the bees do really well up there. So this, these two bits of information came together at kind of at the same time, someone in the club came to me and said, my buddy has um, space where we can do this in North County. So we decided to do this project 
but we also decided on a specific location to take advantage of the feral um, drone stock, the males and in, uh, in the male cast. So we're raising queens. The queens go out and mate with with drones in that area. So keeping honeybees is a, they're wild, domesticated, right? So they're a little bit of both. We don't control who the queens mate with other than to put them in a, in a specific location or to raise drones um, to kind of flood the area, which is something that's on our list to do as well. This was just the research that Dr. Camilo published. Um, so the goal of the project was to raise honeybee queens during the active season, which is pretty short, it's April through July, to have those queens available um, for local beekeepers in, in our club and in the region. The proposed apiary plan, this was back in 2017. This is lo the location in Wellston. There, we chose the location, as I said, because there are very few managed hives in the area. The research, as I described, um, was favorable for this, and it provided an opportunity for hands-on field work for our club members. So it was a large um, area, a yard that was gated, that was, that was safe for us to put hives there. So we defined our starter stock as... Um, overwinter disease-free and treatment-free. And at the time, these were buzzwords in, in beekeeping. So this is where, you know, we're starting to realize that the chemicals are creating problems. The bees are not getting healthier. The mites, uh, which is the big pest, is, is developing resistance. And so there was this push in back in the 15, 16, 17 to be treatment-free and so we had to define what that meant to our club. So that's that. those are our definitions. Um, and this is what we did. So we had five, we had, I think at the time we had 12 members that brought one or two of their, you know, colonies from their healthiest bees that were able to overwinter in our, in our zone. Um, we checked, you know, we ran tests for mites and um, actually did some pathogen testing, uh, which I'll talk more about. Um, the uh, number of beekeeping volunteers helped to manage these hives along with the, the people that were um, leading this. And then they were assessed uh, and put in queen ring boxes so that they could mate, they were harvested and then sold um, to members in the community. We chose. We started out using a number of queen rearing techniques. We didn't land on one until we got the grant. So we played around with swar swarm cells, cell punch on the spot, and using a nightcot as well as grafting. Once we got the grant, we we're only we're raising queens by grafting. So the project timeline was June to September. Uh, and we're the other thing that makes us what we do different is that we are not rushing the harvesting of the queens. That's another area that, of research is that the large queen breeders are harvesting queens as soon as they start laying eggs, and then they're putting in a put them in a box called a queen cage, and they are they go into diapause. So they stop laying until they are released by the beekeeper when the beekeeper purchases the queen and puts it in their hive, that delay seems to be messing with their pheromones. And then the colony kills the queen because they determined she's inferior. So again, we're spending money on queens. We get them, we put them in their hive and the colony replaces her. So we, as part of our process, we um, are leaving the queen to lay in the mating box until her brood is capped. So not only are we letting her mature longer, but we're identifying that she has healthy brood. And that's what this image is. It's pretty, pretty good, solid brood pattern, all the same age, not a lot of skips. Um, anyway, so that's visually how we can identify um, the, the age of the queen and how long she's been laying. So we got, so we started the project and then as I mentioned, Miranda Dushek, who is a customer of mine, she was living in St. Louis at the time, 
And she uh, reached out to me and said, you should apply for a SARE grant. I had no idea what that was. And she was our sponsor. So we so we had a year of, of this under our belt. When I wrote the grant, then I knew exactly what we were doing. So because we had already been doing it for a year. And I think that helped because I had never written a grant before. Um, so we got the grant. And what it really allowed us to do two things is buy a bunch of equipment. Because the problem is, if you are successful in raising these queens, you need to have equipment. They're called mating boxes to put them in. So, you know, you can be a great, you can, you can get that skill down of grafting and raise a bunch of Queens, but if you don't have the equipment to put them in, they're, you know, they're useless. So the grant really allowed us to ramp up the equipment and yes, it is a lot of work, but we did have fun <laughs> at times and being part of a group, you know, some people like to do one chore and some people like to do the other. So it's nice to have a group that everybody loves to paint, but Chris did. Um, this was our three frame um, mating nuke with a feeder. Uh, you see that we was were able to invest in all the boxes that we would need for the upcoming several years. Uh, we built a shed to put all the equipment. That's the other problem with equipment is it's big and bulky and you need to put it somewhere. I don't know anybody, any beekeeper that doesn't have a shed or has a garage that they can't park in anymore. So this was the queen rearing apiary in 2008. The parent colonies are in the back and the queen mating boxes that we painted all these different colors are in the front. Um, we did we did do pathogen testing initially, and that was, again, a big reason why I wanted to apply for the grant so that because this, this testing is expensive. And again, it's something that not the commercial breeders don't do this kind of testing. Um, they test for mites, the mites vector disease. So in our philosophy, you can have a colony that has a lot of mites, but if they are resistant or some in some way genetically immune to the mites, um, you know, if you kill the mites, sometimes you lose that protection. I know that's a little bit into the genetics, but um, we felt it was more important to, to actually look at the level of disease, um, not just the, the number of mites in the hive. And that's, so we have, have worked with testing of uh, DNA um, pathogen load testing since the beginning and it is very expensive to do a full panel we did have as you can see we had it was a we were shocked that we had this much disease and what we thought were healthy colonies but a lot of this we don't see anymore so we know that we're breeding you know so we're doing some natural selection i'm gonna say okay so here's our grafting team this is uh we're able to uh, use the landowner's building just to go in and, and do this in the comfort of being able to sit down and not be in 100 degree weather. Um, then we're back outside building the cell builder. This is where we put the cells. We, uh, you know, charge, supercharge this with feeding pollen and light syrup. And we throw in a bunch of bees and and let them raise a bunch of queens. This is, an, uh, this is the original grafting timeline, which is just a lot of work. You know, you have, when you're doing this, um, you really have to, to lay out a schedule and you have to adhere to the schedule. If you have multiple Queens, uh, emerging in a hive before you take them out, they just kill each other. You know, that's what queen bees do is they, they sting each other until one, one survives. And so you don't want to raise 25 queens and then have them all duke it out because you didn't pull them out of the of the finisher yet early enough. Our second grant. So COVID was a disaster. Of course, we lost a lot of people. We had three three people that hung hung in with it. We raised probably 50 queens the first year and maybe 90 the second year. The second grant really allowed us to um continue with the pathogen testing and get um, set up an, an research, I'm sorry, a resource yard that was 35 miles away. So we continue to raise queens. We grafted from several lines, again, from the pathogen testing, we were able to select the colonies we were going to raise from. Um, and we had a second 
resource yard, harvesting resources, bringing those resources to the queen mating yard, and just as I described, just you know, supercharging this colony to raise 20, 30, 40 queen cells. That's what they look like. So this is the middle of the year. Well, this is at peak. So we've got maybe 50 queens that are in these mating boxes in June and July. So to review, queens emerge from a cell. They harden off in five days. They need a few days for mating flight, um, two to five days to ripen. She begins to lay eggs. That is capped in 10 days. And then we assess. And again, this is a picture of a of we would grade this queen queen highly. This is probably a four or five. We mark, harvest, grade, and ID the queens to sell. This is the pathogen testing, just to say um, we have a little bit of five out of 15 pathogens in our yard, but this lab has been quantifying this so that we can compare our numbers to low, average, and high, and our numbers are all below average or average. So we feel that we are successfully raising healthy queens that to then sell to folks. So the funding allowed us to have a complete picture of the health of our colonies by paying for the pathogen testing, and that could direct our grafting. Um, we don't do any selection. This is not, you know, Varroa sensitive hygienic or low propolis or anything, we only call the colonies that are either mean or have a high mite load that we're afraid they're going to share mites with other colonies in the yard. And that is, has, there's a term for it now, it's called black box bee breeding, where you're just removing the, the one, you're calling the ones that don't meet your standard. We grade the queens. This is what we grade them on. Brood pattern, workability, size of the queen, storage of resources, row mite control, small high beetle control. We sell it. Um, we ask the beekeepers, we say, you're going to get a survey from us. You have to answer the survey so we know, you know, if you like the queen or if you're getting what you think you're paying for. Um, and then I provide that information to Sarah. This is what we did this year, our production numbers. We raised 124 mated queens. We sold 84, we, um, sorry, in 2023. We overwintered 24 nukes. This year, we're overwintering 40 nukes. Those, those are the little boxes on top of the parent colonies. They're getting the heat from the parent colony to help them survive the winter so we can sell those in the spring. And our annual revenue in 2023 was $9,600. The queens on the left-hand side are at my store. That's queens that we purchased from another supplier. The queens on the right are the queens from our SSA yard. So I just look at this picture and think the bees are telling me that they like our queens. Okay. And this is for anybody who wants to get started. You know, I think I talk to a lot of clubs and I try to just inspire them to think about either doing this as individuals or doing this as a club. Sometimes the, you know, the timeline and the equipment needs can be daunting, but for anybody who wants to play around with this, Randy Oliver is, has a great website. There's so much information, but go to this, um, Queens for Pennies, and you can, you know, start doing this for yourself. And if you're successful in raising some Queens, maybe you raise more than you need, you can start sharing them with people in your club or in your area. Um, I did want to mention, I, I know I, if anybody's interested, I have copies of the pathogen testing if you want to see who's doing that work for us. And if anybody's interested, this is my new favorite book. I, sorry, I don't have a picture up there, but it's called Raising Resilient, Resilient Bees. This is a great book.